And I remember being very excited because I knew Spotted Lanternfly was a big deal, but also very devastated because I knew Spotted Lanternfly was a big deal. Um, and I think that's kind of the crazy thing about this pest. It's equally fascinating and devastating. Trying to move through my slides here. I think it's probably just a delay. Um, but I think if there is one positive thing to come out of Spotted Lanternfly, it's all of the collaborative work that it's fostered between agencies and different states. So I'm hoping you'll see this next slide soon. It's really just uh, to acknowledge some of the groups that have already done a lot of work up to this point, uh, work involving outreach and treatment, distributing information and research. Um, and I, I really almost feel like I'm giving this webinar on behalf of these folks because you'll see a lot of their images and fact sheets throughout my slides. Sorry, that's not working for you, Lori. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. If this persists, we can always escape out and just kind of reboot it. Um, can you see the cursor moving? Yes, yeah, we can. Ah, okay, here we there go. There we go. Nice. All right. Okay, so um, these are just some of our partners. I know I probably left some major players off of this slide. These are just the groups that I've worked with directly, but really just thank you to all of our partners that have done so much good work already. So today I plan on covering some basic information on the spotted lanternfly, or at least what we've observed here in Virginia. And I'll touch on its distribution, its biology, and how to identify the different life stages, its hosts and the damage it can cause, and then how we've been monitoring its spread and trying to control it with treatment and a quarantine. Uh, and then also how you can help slow the spread of this invasive insect. So we'll start with distribution. The spotted lanternfly is an invasive plant hopper that is native to Asia, specifically China, India, and Vietnam. It has also been reported in Japan since I believe the 1930s and then was discovered as an exotic species in South Korea in 2004. So in South Korea and Japan, it's been reported as a pest of grapes, fruit trees, and ornamental shrubs since 2006 and then it was first discovered in North America in 2014. And this map shows where spotted lanternfly has been found in North America since 2014. It was first found in Berks County, Pennsylvania, and uh, I believe is now found in at least 14 Pennsylvania counties. It has also been found in Virginia, New Jersey, and Delaware, as you can see on the, in the red on this map. And the yellow on this map shows states where uh, a single spotted lanternfly insect was found, but there is no established infestation. So, you know, this would be if uh, an insect hitchhiked on a vehicle or in a packing material and was discovered, but no actual established population. But, you know, this in itself is disturbing because it shows all the, the close calls they've had in these areas in yellow. Here in Virginia, spotted lanternfly was discovered in January of 2018 in the city of Winchester and Frederick County, which is the very northern tip of the state of Virginia. And it was discovered at what we've been calling kind of the perfect site. It was at a, a stone brick company where stones are shipped in and out. And the location was just off the highway near the railroad, which was lined with Tree of Heaven, um, its preferred host. And this was also near the Virginia Inland Port, so a very industrial area. And all of this was kind of just a recipe for disaster and really the perfect place for spotted lanternfly to show up. So we definitely have an active infestation in Virginia right now, and I'll talk more about how we've been trying to manage that later. So right now we'll move into the biology. Uh, the spotted lanternfly is a plant hopper in the order Hemiptera in the family Fulgoridae. And Fulgorids are mostly tropical plant hoppers. They're often referred to as lan lanternflies because of this inflated portion on the head of some of the species. 
And so a lot of people get confused because spotted lanternfly may look like a moth and it has the word fly in its name, but it's actually neither a moth nor a fly, it's a plant hopper. And you can see the different life stages here from egg to early nymph, then developed nymph to adult. So here are the egg masses. Females lay eggs in rows and then cover them with a waxy secretion. So in the photo on the right, you can see the individual rows of eggs um, just coming out of the egg mass that I guess the female didn't completely cover here. At first, the egg mass is shiny and white, but then it will kind of darken and fade over time and turn more powdery as it dries. And there are approximately 30 to 50 eggs per egg mass. Egg masses are about an inch and a half long and flat and gray, and they're laid on smooth surfaces such as tree trunks and branches, rocks, stones, lawn furniture, cars. Um, they also seem to like rusty metal. And to me, they really just look like a blob of clay and can be very difficult to find because they're, they're pretty cryptic and they just kind of blend into whatever they've been laid on. Here you see egg masses on a tree trunk, but also some wood and a large stone. And because they lay egg masses on pretty much any smooth surface, this is the stage that's easily transported to new areas on accident. Um, eggs could be laid on vehicles or outdoor equipment, and then if those items are moved to another place before they hatch, then you're potentially introducing spotted lanternfly to a new area. So it's really important to be able to identify the egg masses. Um, they are they can be very camouflage and hard to spot, especially you know, when you first start looking, but you do start to develop a search image after you find a few. And this is a really great publication that Virginia Cooperative Extension put out that shows spotted lanternfly egg mass lookalikes in Virginia. So in the top left corner, you can see a normal spotted lanternfly egg mass. And then the photo next to that shows an egg mass without the covering. Uh, so for some reason, sometimes the females will not cover the eggs with that waxy coating. And then you just see the, the exposed rows of eggs. And you can tell also if the eggs have hatched by if you see a small oval opening on the top of the egg. So it does look like some of those eggs in that photo have hatched. Um, but there are some things out there that do look similar to spotted lanternfly egg masses, and that's what this publication is for. I think they look most like gypsy moth egg masses, which you can see there in the center of the page. Uh, but you could also confuse them with other eggs, maybe from the eastern tent caterpillar or canker worms, uh, maybe even wheel bug eggs. And then there's a, a mantis egg in the upper right there, which looks pretty similar, but also just a lichen on bark sometimes looks very similar to the spotted lanternfly egg mass. So, you know, once you've seen a few, it gets easier, but it can take a while to develop that search image. Here are the nymphs emerging from an egg mass. There are four instars. The first through third instars are black with white spots on the body and the legs. Initially, they're uh, pretty small, approximately one eighth inch long, and then they grow to be about three eighths inch long. And at this stage, they're still black with white spots and they have a projection on their head. They don't fly at this stage, but they can quickly hop and jump away. By the fourth end star, the nymphs develop red patches over their body, uh, but while keeping that white spot pattern. And by this time, they're over half an inch long. And so I like this photo. You can see a third instar nymph that is still black on the same branch as a fourth instar nymph that has turned red. And here are some nymph lookalikes. I think the nymphs are pretty easy to identify, but there are a couple things out there that uh, do look similar, such as wheelbug and assassin bug nymphs. There are also oak tree hopper nymphs, which are shown at the bottom left. And I'm not very familiar with these, but I can see how the color and the shape may be confusing. So just make sure uh, you're looking for that black and white or red color pattern and also the projection on the head. 
So these are obviously the adults. They have black bodies and wings that are usually held tent-like when at rest. The adults are about an inch long when they are holding their wings back like that at rest. And then when they have their wings fully spread out, they have a wingspan of about an inch and a half. The four her wings are tan and gray with black spots, and the hind wings are banded black and then uh, white and then that deep red color. The adults are pretty active, uh, and, but they are the only stage that can fly, and they do tend to hop more than they fly. So it's really beautiful when you see the wings uh, fully expanded, showing that, that red in the hind wings, but most commonly you'll find them with the wings folded back in that resting position. Here are a few spotted lanternfly adult lookalikes that people may get confused with. They are probably most often mistaken for moths, such as the tiger moth in the bottom left there. I think that's the most common false ID we get. But they may also look like the buck or leopard moth, or maybe even tree hoppers or the Atlantis webworm. And any of these uh, lookalike publications can be found on the Virginia Cooperative Extension Spotted Lanternfly website. And I'll have a link for that at the end of this presentation, uh, but I think you can also just Google Spotted Lanternfly Virginia and you'll get a lot of good information. Okay, here is the life cycle as we know it in Virginia. And this is such a new pest in Virginia that you know we've really only had two seasons to observe its behavior so we're still learning and collecting data but right now it appears that the nymphs start emerging in early may and develop through their four instars through the summer uh, adults start emerging in july and are active into the fall and then they start laying eggs in the fall and the egg masses are the life stage that overwinters so so far we've just observed a single generation per year uh, last year we observed the first egg mass in mid-September, so we should be seeing eggs soon. And I believe that the life cycle that we are seeing here in Virginia is a couple weeks ahead of what they are observing further north in Pennsylvania. So the known host range for spotted lanternfly it exceeds 65 species worldwide, and they certainly prefer Tree of Heaven or Alanthus. Now, Alanthus itself is an invasive species that is very common in Virginia. Uh, it grows quickly on disturbed sites and along roadways and outcompetes a lot of our native plants. So these are images of Alanthus or Tree of Heaven on the right here. In the summer, it has pink flowers, which you can see on the bottom photo. And the leaves are compound, so in the top photo, you're really only seeing two leaves, and each leaf is composed of many leaflets. Since Tree of Heaven, or sorry, excuse me, since Spotted Lanternfly uh, prefers Tree of Heaven, a lot of the management recommendations involve controlling Tree of Heaven. And if you're looking for Spotted Lanternfly, it's smart to start looking at or near Tree of Heaven plants. But the Spotted Lanternfly does feed on other plants as well. Uh, it also prefers grape, apple, and stone fruit, and has been observed feeding on trees such as oak, poplar, walnut, maple, and pine. Now the list of host plants worldwide is over 65 plants, but since spotted lanternfly hasn't been in Virginia that long, we have a much shorter list here. So this slide shows the list of host plants on which uh, Virginia Cooperative Extension has found spotted lanternfly so far in Virginia. And from what we've observed, the nymphs seem to be very opportunistic generalist feeders with um, a really broad host range. And then as they become adults, they narrow that host range down and start to show a much stronger preference for Tree of Heaven. So my colleague was actually up in the spotted lanternfly infestation in Virginia last week where adults are currently active. And she took this photo of spotted lanternfly on Tree of Heaven. Um, and this was a place where we had seen nymphs on all different types of plant species just a month or so ago, and now she was seeing them mainly on Tree of Heaven. So just a small example of how they um, do seem to narrow down that host range as adults. So we know they prefer Tree of Heaven, but we don't yet know whether Tree of Heaven is a required host in order for them to reproduce. And that's kind of been the theory that females may need to feed on Tree of Heaven in order to produce viable eggs. 
but that hasn't yet been proven or disproven. Uh, but I do know that that is something that is currently being researched. So what damage do spot and la spotted lanternflies cause? Well, they are flow and feeders, so they insert their piercing sucking mouth parts into the plant tissue and then feed on the plant sap. And on trees, we're not really sure how much direct damage spotted lanternfly can cause. Uh, we know in heavy populations, some yellowing and browning of foliage and branch dieback has been observed. And then certainly just the feeding probably weakens the tree and makes it much more susceptible to other pests and diseases. Um, but it, it still is such a new pest that there hasn't really been time to fully understand the long-term impact to trees. On fruit crops, feeding may reduce yields, specifically for grape and fruit trees. Um, high levels of feeding will stress the plants and decrease plant health. And I believe some vineyards in Pennsylvania have started seeing pretty significant yield loss, like up to 90%, and they're having to apply more insecticides to protect their crops, which can substantially increase the cost of production. And we'll talk about treatment in a little bit, but the problem with spotted lanternfly is that you can spray and kill the insect on your crops, but then more can just move in from other plants in the surrounding areas. So some places are just being continually inundated. And you know, if your crops are your livelihood, this can be a pretty dire situation. Another significant factor is the mold. So because spotted lanternfly is a flow and feeder, the plant sap that they ingest contains a lot of uh, carbohydrate-rich liquid, which is not completely, um, or the insect isn't able to completely digest it. So they end up excreting this excess sugary, sticky substance called honeydew, and it can get everywhere, all over the plants on which they feed, as you can see in these photos. Um, Although I, so in these photos, you're actually seeing the black sooty mold, which then develops on the honeydew, and that's what uh, the black is on, in these photos. The sooty mold doesn't directly damage the plant, but it blocks light for photosynthesis and can then reduce the quality of the crop. So entire trunks of trees may turn black due to sooty mold. And then also other yeast-like organisms can grow on the honeydew, and uh, we often see white yeast patches on heavily infested trees, and all of this gives off a really unpleasant vinegar smell. In addition to causing damage to the plant, the spotted lanternfly can also just become a really significant nuisance, nuisance pest. All of the honeydew and sooty mold can get over everything outside, including cars, decks, outdoor furniture. Um, and it's important to note that the sooty mold is harmless to people, but it can certainly affect your quality of life if it's covering everything in your yard. And so uh, my colleague that was at the spotted lanternfly infestation in Virginia last week at one point thought it was drizzling and then realized it was just honeydew falling on her head from spotted lanternfly feeding above her. So there are certainly impacts other than just plant damage. Okay, so now we'll move on to monitoring and treatment. And here I'm really just able to speak about what we've been doing, what's been going on in Virginia. Um, I'm pretty sure everyone with current spotted lanternfly infestations are conducting similar monitoring and treatment activities, but I'll just be going over what I'm aware of in Virginia. So in Virginia, surveys began immediately after a spotted lanternfly was found in January 2018. And these surveys were to delimit the infested area, which at that time was only a couple square miles. Since then, survey work from May to August is tree banding to monitor the population and then egg mass surveys are done in the fall and the winter. And this is a map from our Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services that shows all of the surveys completed in Virginia from April 2018 to April 2019. And I really like this map because it shows a lot of points. So our folks are out there looking for this pest, but it also shows a lot of green, which is negative fines. There are a lot of places in Virginia where spotted lanternfly is not, and that's good news. So far, the only red or positive finds are in the very northernmost part of the state. 
tree banding in Virginia has been done on Tree of Heaven, mostly greater than five inches in diameter. And there's a high concentration of banding sites near the infested area, but also at high risk sites throughout the entire state. And these sites, these high risk sites would include anywhere where there's a lot of traffic or a lot of imports, especially products coming from other states um, with or near known infestations. Virginia Cooperative Extension is also coordinating a citizen scientist tree branding program to get the involvement of local landowners. And this is a great program, and they've been able to get master naturalists, master gardeners, and tree stewards in Virginia to ban trees on their property to monitor for the spotted lanternfly. These volunteers were given materials for banding and then um, asked to attend a training session where they were taught how to ban the trees, um, how to check the bands and collect data, and then how to report the banding data in a survey 123 ArcGIS application that they can um, get on their smartphones. So this has really enabled us in Virginia to expand our capacity to monitor for spotted lanternfly since we certainly all have limited time and resources. And so getting volunteer landowner uh, involvement has been pretty critical. In addition to surveys, there is also treatment being done in Virginia. The treatment is being coordinated by our Virginia Department of Agriculture and being conducted by a USDA APHIS contractor. And at this time, they are only treating tree of heaven. If the tree is six inches or less, they are treating it with an herbicide to kill the tree. And to do this, they are using triclopyr applied as a hack and squirt method. Uh, and that's just where you cut incisions into the trunk of the tree and then apply the chemical to that, that freshly cut area. If the tree is greater than six inches, they are treating it with insecticide to kill any spotted lanternfly that feed on it. And the current insecticide treatment is a Dinotefron product applied as a basal bark spray. And this is what the result of these treatments should look like. On the left, you can see a bunch of dead tree of heaven after being treated with the herbicide. And on the right, you can see a bunch of spotted lanternfly at the base of a tree that was treated with insecticide. So my colleague who was up at the infested area last week, she saw a bunch of dead spotted lanternfly adults on the ground. And uh, presumably those were individuals that had fed upon tree to trees. So that's good news. Um, but there also seemed to be quite a few still alive and feeding on trees that had been marked as being treated. So there probably is a little room for improvement when it comes to these treatment protocols, but this really is such a new pest that there's still a lot of research surrounding it, um, trying to figure out what the best treatment methods are. Also, just a, a side note, in 2018, the treatment area in Virginia was over 2,000 acres. Uh, unfortunately, our efforts in 2018 did not eradicate spotted lanternfly, and that treatment area expanded in 2019 to be approximately 7,500 acres. So one of the things that I think everyone is struggling with regarding this pest is what are the management recommendations, especially for homeowners. So I wanted to share the management strategies that we are currently recommending in Virginia, although I'm sure these will change as we get a better handle on this pest. From September to May, we are telling landowners to look for egg masses and destroy any that they find. And you can destroy egg masses by scraping them with a plastic card or a really any hard surface and scraping them into a plastic bag or other container with ethanol, diluted Clorox, or hand sanitizer. A bunch of different agencies have produced these scraper cards, uh, which essentially are the size and shape of a credit card with information and photos to help identify the spotted lanternfly, and you can use those scraper cards to scrape the egg masses off trees. In May through November, you should be looking for nymphs and adults. And if you find them, kill them, kill them, kill them. Uh, if numbers are low enough, they can be crushed or placed in a container with alcohol or hand sanitizer. And then if you're dealing with a larger population, they can be treated with a contact or a systemic insecticide. A, concept, uh, excuse me, a contact insecticide 
kill spotted lanternfly with direct sprays to the insect and then a systemic insecticide that's taken up by the plant and then kill spotted lanternfly when they feed on the plant. Uh, there's a, a few different ways to apply systemic insecticides so that the plant takes up the chemical. You can apply it as a, a soil drench around the base of the tree, uh, a trunk spray, often called a basal bark spray, or you can um, inject it directly into the tree. And Penn State Extension put out a really excellent management guide for homeowners and landscape professionals that uh, it contains a chart that lists different, all the different insecticide options with active ingredients, um, application method, and efficacy. So you can find this on their website and that's a really good resource. There's still a lot of research going on regarding the most effective management in terms of the best chemical, the most appropriate application method, the best time to treat, and then also um, the treatment that poses the least risk to non-target organisms. So we always encourage homeowners to hire certified pesticide applicators to do this work. And hopefully as we learn more about this pest and how it responds to treatment, we'll be able to narrow down our management recommendations. Now since Tree of Heaven is such a preferred host, a significant part of an integrated pest management approach for spotted lanternfly is to remove Tree of Heaven. And you know, since Tree of Heaven is an invasive plant anyways, this is kind of a win-win if done correctly. So we recommend destroying Tree of Heaven by treating it with an herbicide as either a trunk spray or a hack, of, hack and squirt method. And triclopyr usually works pretty well for this. Uh, cut stump is usually listed as an option to control tree of heaven and that's where you uh, just cut the tree, cut the stem, and then immediately apply herbicide to the stump. But that's probably not as effective as either a, a basal bark spray or a hack and squirt technique. And the reason is the problem with cutting is that tree of heaven will vigorously re-sprout from roots and stumps. And you can see that in this photo. Uh, in this photo, tree of heaven stems were cut at about breast height. And then within a couple weeks, they were re-sprouting, as you can see there. So please do not just cut tree of heaven. And if you do have to cut, treat the stump immediately. So we do think that uh, treating and removing killing tree of heaven is a good strategy, but a possible issue is that after removing tree of heaven, spotted lanternfly may just move to other plants. So we do recommend leaving trap trees if at all possible. And the management recommendations for trap trees are to remove 85 to 90% of the tree of heaven on your property using herbicide and then treat the remaining 10 to 15 percent uh, left over with insecticide. So you can see in this graphic the brown X's are the trees that have been killed with herbicide and then there were some trees that were left and then they were treated with insecticide um, as shown with the blue lines there. Spotted lanternfly is attracted to those trees because of its preference for tree of heaven and then it is uh, killed when it feeds on the trees that were treated with the insecticide. And I've heard that one trap tree can kill thousands of spotted lanternfly adults. So this is a pretty good way to kill a lot at once. Also by treating only the trap trees, you're um, actually reducing the total amount of insecticide used and hopefully protecting non-targets and beneficial insects. So these are the current management recommendations, but like I said, we may find better options in the future. Quarantines are also part of this approach, and they're currently being used to slow the spread of spotted lanternfly. And I really like this map that was published by the New York State Integrated Pest Management Program. It shows all spotted lanternfly quarantines as of June 11th, 2019. And so I can speak for a few minutes on the quarantine in Virginia, but that is regulated by our Department of Agriculture. Uh, they established this quarantine in Virginia this year to restrict the movement of certain articles that might be capable of transporting the spotted lanternfly. And 
currently the regulated area in Virginia is the County of Frederick and the city of Winchester. So if you look at that map, it's just the very tip, um, the very northern tip of Virginia in blue there. And these are all the regulated articles as defined by Virginia's Spotted Lantern and Flight Quarantine. Uh, I've just highlighted a few here. All plants and plant parts in any shape or form, uh, construction material and equipment, packing materials, outdoor household articles like lawn furniture, grills, lawn mowers, all vehicles not stored inside. So really anything that is outside is a regulated article. And this sounds a little crazy, but it's really the only way to have written this quarantine because spotted lanternfly will lay eggs on any smooth surface. So really potentially anything outside has the potential to have an egg nest on it. And then if that object is moved, you could be transporting the insect to a new location. Now, businesses uh, could still move regulated articles in Virginia, but only after getting a permit with our Department of Agriculture and performing a self-inspection. So there is an online training course that one has to take um, prior to applying for a permit. And this course goes over how to identify spotted lanternfly, how to check your vehicles and other regulated articles, um, and then the different uh, life stages you should be looking for. So once you take that online training and successfully get a permit with our Department of Ag, then you need to conduct a self-inspection by um, completing the, the checklist that you can see here before you move out of the quarantine area. And so at Department of Forestry, we've been taking this really seriously because our vehicles are regulated um, articles, and we've been training our foresters to do this self-inspection on their trucks. And we're also trying to work with the logging community to help get the word out to loggers in the area. Okay, what can you do to help slow the spread of the spotted lanternfly? Probably the biggest thing that any of us can do to help is to learn how to identify the different life stages and to just always be looking for them. Um, also always inspect vehicles and outdoor equipment before leaving infested areas and do not park or store items near trees. So this photo was taken in the infested area in Virginia, and this person is doing exactly what we tell folks not to do. Uh, he was in the infested area when adults were out, and he parked right next to a grove, a tree of heaven. So, you know, if he had had his windows open, an adult could have easily flown in and then been transported to wherever he went next. So we certainly discourage this and um, also recommend that you keep your windows closed when driving through infested areas so adults can't fly in. We also encourage people to uh, never move firewood. There's always the risk of egg masses being on firewood and then being moved to a new location. So we tell people to please try to buy local and burn local when um, dealing with firewood. Uh, please kill any spotted lanternfly insect that you find. If it's just a few individuals, you can plop them in a container of alcohol. If it's a larger population, you may want to consider insecticides. And if you have spotted lanternfly on your property, please scrape and destroy egg masses, uh, remove tree of heaven with herbicides, and apply insecticides when appropriate. Now there is a lot of research currently happening right now, so I just wanted to kind of end with this list to show you how much work is being done. And this is really a small list compared to the actual work and research that, that folks are conducting. Um, and probably each of these topics could have their own webinar. But definitely folks are looking at, do spotted lanternfly require Tree of Heaven? We certainly, um, it certainly seems to be a strongly preferred host, but is it actually required for uh, development and for the adults to be able to lay viable eggs? People are also looking at and researching the most effective chemical control options, looking at different active ingredients, different application methods, and when is the best time to apply different chemicals. And then there's also research looking at the non-target effects of pesticides. Uh, some of the most effective 
systemic insecticides are neonicotinoids. And so we certainly need to learn a little bit more about the impact of that. And biological control, there's definitely work being done on the search for biocontrol agents. In North America, there are a few natural enemies that have been observed feeding on spotted lanternfly, such as uh, wheel bugs and stink bugs, but not enough to, to control the population, at least not yet. There also is an egg parasitoid in China that is currently being considered for biocontrol. Uh, but um, that'll take a while to fully analyze and test for non-target impacts before it's considered, um, before it's released here in North America. And then also there's groups looking at fungal pathogens and if bioinsecticides are effective treatment options. There do appear to be a couple native fungal pathogens that attack and kill spotted lanternfly. So uh, we need to do more research to determine if this is something that could actually control a population. Really, since spotted lanternfly feeds on so many different plants, a true integrated pest management approach is necessary. So all different control methods are being researched right now. Uh, this one about tree health, uh, long-term impact on tree health, this is one that I'm very interested in uh, with the Department of Forestry to uh, fully understand how spotted lanternfly will impact our forests. We know it's an agricultural pest, we know it's a nuisance pest, but um, still trying to see how big of a forest pest it's gonna be, and also how far into the forest spotted lanternfly will go, especially if there is no tree of heaven in that area. And then there are also people um, researching um, traps and lures and trying to find better ways to monitor for spotted lanternfly. So in summary, this is still a very new pest and one that we are still trying to get a handle on. But as with most invasives, early detection really is the key to successful management. So if there's one thing that I can kind of um, push out to everyone listening today, it's please be on the lookout for this insect and learn how to identify the different life stages. And I think I will end on this slide again and this uh, just list all of our partners. I'm sure there's ones that I didn't include, especially in New Jersey, Maryland, New York, and Delaware. But I've also added to this slide two websites, one for Virginia Cooperative Extension and one for Penn State Extension. And these are links to websites where you can go and report spotted laser and fly sightings and also just get more information. So these are really good resources um, and they have a lot of additional information. But that's, I think, all I have right now. So I'm happy to answer any questions um, that came in. That was wonderful, Lori. Thank you. What an excellent presentation. I thought that I knew pretty innate, but I definitely learned a lot. Um, okay, so we're going to open the presentation now for questions from the audience. Um, if you have yet to type in your questions, it's not too late. Just go ahead and throw them in the chat window, um, and I will gather them as they come. Um, I just got a question uh, if someone could get a copy of the presentation. This presentation will be uploaded onto YouTube, um, and it will be available on demand anytime that you'd like. Uh, and you can just go ahead and click on it through the same webinar portal uh, that you got here from. All right. Okay, Lori, you ready for some questions? Go for it. Okay. Um, first one, gypsy moths seem to congregate and are easily found at the bottom six feet of a tree. Do lanternfly behave similarly? So when I've seen them, uh, they've been anywhere on the tree. Um, and I know that's definitely true of egg masses. You can find egg masses at the very canopy of the tree. Um, they do kind of have this behavior of climbing and hopping and then like falling down and then climbing and hopping and then falling down. Um, so maybe there's more around the base just because they've fallen down at that point. Um, but I think really you could find them anywhere on the tree. All right, um, let me see. Have scientists quantified the risk that spotted lanternfly poses to crops and quality of life? 
Uh, I don't think I know that an the answer to that question. Um, I'm sure it's something that people are looking at. You know, I, I do know that, um, you know, you can quantify, um, you know, how many dollars are in an industry, right? So, like, um, the wine industry in Pennsylvania is this many dollars. And so I, I know that those numbers have um, been thrown around because spotted lanternfly is, does pose a huge threat to those types of industries. But in terms of like just a number uh, for the quality of life, I, I don't know if that exists. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, how close to the North Carolina border have these been found? Um, so in terms of infestation, it has not been found anywhere near North Carolina. Now, I, there may have been found, there may have been like um, certain individuals found in a couple places. Like, just like I mentioned, sometimes you'll find an individual that maybe got mixed in with a shipment um, or hitchhiked on someone's car. But if it's, if it's just like one insect and there was no established population, it, it hasn't made it on the map yet. So the only states with infestations are Pennsylvania, Virginia, Delaware, and New Jersey. Okay. Um, is there any evidence that cold will affect the lanternfly the way it does the um, hemlock woolly adelgid? So I know that's something that's being researched, and I don't know what the results are. Um, that's probably going to be my answer to a lot of questions, just because it's such a new test, and there's so much research happening right now. Um, but I, I do know that specifically is something people are looking at. Excellent. And that actually will segue into another question that we got. Where is the best place to check in for update information on this pest? Um, I think probably the two that I have listed on my screen right now, um, that's the Virginia website and the Penn State website. Is the lifespan of the spotter and lantern fly just one season? Um, I guess is there one generation per year is the question? What we have observed in Virginia has just been one generation per year. Okay. Uh, can the lanternfly reproduce on a dead tree of heaven? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that either. Yeah, no, that, that is, I, I haven't heard that asked anywhere either. Um, and I, for those I, people, I don't think so because part of the management strategies are to remove tree of heaven. Um, and for trees that are less than six inches, um, they're not actually physically cutting them down because they don't really pose a, a safety hazard if they're that small. Um, so they're just killing them and then leaving them standing. So I, I can't imagine they would be doing that if it was still a plant that um, could sustain spotted lanternfly. Okay. Um, oh, I just got uh, a private message saying that someone observes spotted lantern fly on the dead tree of heaven. So I'm going to follow up with them, and we'll see if we if we hear any um, neat in the field updates. But yeah, I'm not sure if that means that they were actually surviving or reproducing on them. Okay, okay. Let's see here. Um, when the egg masses are laid on the tree, how high above the ground can you find them? As high as the tree will go. Uh huh. Uh huh. I've I've been out there with binoculars, looking at the very top of the tree, trying to determine if it was an egg mass or not. I think it's a very canopy. Um, when tree banding, have you had any problems with bycatch? Yeah, so that's why I'm really hopeful that that research um, on traps and lures gives us a, a better way to trap and monitor for the insect. Um, the a lot of the banding is just using sticky bands, and that's you know obviously not specific for lantern flies. So you do get a lot of other insects, um, non-target organisms. There's definitely ways that you can minimize that by even just making the bands narrower, so there's less surface area. Um, and there's a few different types of bands you can use that uh, decrease the the risk of catching non-targets. But 
that is an issue and certainly one that um, folks are looking into to try to improve. Okay. So speaking of bands, how often are the bands required to be monitored? Is that a weekly check, monthly check? The ones that we've been using, which are just the, the sticky bands web coat, we had up from May through uh, August, and we were checking them every two weeks. Okay. If the eggs are deposited on non-plant items, how long can the nymphs survive without feeding? I'm not sure if that's known yet either. No. Um, I, yeah, I don't know how long they could go without feeding, but the fact that they can feed on so many different plants means that you know, even if they weren't deposited directly on a plant, they could probably find something in the vicinity pretty quickly. You know, they're, they're not specific. They don't just need one certain plant. So they'll hatch and they'll find something pretty quickly. Okay. Um, is it known a uh, lifespan of the lanternfly? Um, not sure what that question is asking. There's one generation per year. And then how long can the individual insect live for, I think, might be? Uh, like maybe, maybe the, how long can the adult live? Yeah, yeah, let's go with that. Um, so I'm sure that is known, but I do not have that right in front of me. Um, nymphs start emerging in May or kind of late April, and then you start seeing adults mid-July. Um, and I think the latest you would see adults would maybe be November. Okay. But one individual adult insect, I'm not sure exactly how long that one adult would live. Okay. Uh, so here's a specific question for, and you may, you may, may or may not know this, and, and folks, if, if we can't answer it off the bat, I do encourage you just to check out the portal or the, um, the link that Lori provided provided at the end of her presentation. Um, must residents of Frederick County, Virginia comply with the quarantine before driving across the county line? Sorry, is that a question? Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah. So, so, so do, do the residents, the question is do they do the self-inspection? That's right, yeah, in Frederick. So, yeah, so I don't, I, I don't know um, how if everyone is complying with the quarantine, um, it, all we can do is try to make people aware of it and try to make people aware of the regulations. Um, and it's it's not difficult. You know, really all we're asking you to do is just step out of your car, do a quick check, walk around the vehicle, um, and then go through the checklist and make sure you checked all part of your vehicle. Whether or not residents are actually doing that or not, I can't, I can't speak to that. Um, I know at the department, Department of Forestry, we are certainly doing it every time we enter and then leave the quarantine area. Um, and we're trying to get the word out and um, tell as many people as we can, all, all different groups, about the quarantine and how they can help. Yeah, and it sounds like it's a lot like the Don't Move Firewood campaign. We can't get everyone to comply, but if you can do anything you can to spread the word on how important or help educate your friends and neighbors about how important that is, um, it can really make a difference. All right. Um, can the female lay more than one egg mass, or do they lay an egg mass oh, a day for a month? No, I don't think so. So, yeah. Can can a female lay more than one egg mass? <laughs> that was actually something I had in this presentation because I had read somewhere that they could lay up to two egg masses a year, a season, but then I went back and I could not find that information anywhere else, so I took it out. So my answer is I thought I read somewhere that they could lay two egg masses a season, um, but I could be wrong. It may just be one. Okay. Um, do you know, all right, this is an interesting question. Do you know if the in, um, invasion of spotted lanternfly has displaced any other pests? Uh, I think this is more of like a larger ecological dynamic question. Does that does that make sense? 
Yeah, and that's a really good question. Um, I think we don't really know the answer to that yet because this is such a new pest. I'm sure there will be impacts like that uh, further down the road. Um, you know, I was I think I was talking to someone even this could have a lot of impacts on all all different levels. Um, even for for birds, if it, it doesn't seem like birds are eating the spotted lanternfly, so this could also even impact our bird populations. Um, these are just things that we don't really know yet since we've only really been dealing with this pest in, in Virginia for two years and only a couple more in Pennsylvania. Okay, um, so just, I, I know you, you commented on this before, but as we're running out of time here, um, just as sort of a take home message. So if someone has observed spotted lanternfly, um, and let's do this, make this a two part. If they were able to collect it or take a photo, who did they contact to report this? So, um, if you're if you're in Virginia, I would say use that link right there. Um, that's the link for the Virginia Cooperative Extension Spotted Lanternfly website, and you can report online there. Um, you can also report to a Department of Forestry personnel, Department of Agriculture, or any of the extension agents. Um, if you're in Pennsylvania, use the other link to report through the Penn State Extension website. Um, but really, we're all kind of working together on this. So really, any state agency or um, extension group would be able to help you with this. This, you know, like I said in the beginning, that's one small good thing that has come out of this is that um, it's a, fostered a lot of collaborative work, and all of these different groups are working together. So. If, if you think you found it, um, definitely maybe first try one of these two websites, but I think um, any of these agencies would be happy to help you out. Excellent, excellent. Okay, um, let's see, I think that might be about it. Let's see here. Um, oh, do you communicate with the countries of origin where spotted lanternfly is native to? Do you communicate in terms of information sharing? So I personally am not communicating with, communicating with those countries, but I do know um, that since it was, it's native to Asia, um, China, India, and Vietnam, but it was found in South Korea in 2004, and it's become a, a pretty bad pest there. So a lot of the literature and research that was kind of already out there on the spotted lanternfly before we um, found it in North America was published from South Korea. So that has been uh, where we've been getting a lot of our information. Okay, excellent. Um, all right, everybody. Um, thank you so much, Lori. That was such an excellent Q&A. Um, really, really good stuff on the fly. Thank you so much. Um, all right, everyone who's attending, I'm gonna go ahead and turn Lori loose. Um, so. Once this is completed, go ahead and return to your browser and complete step two to complete the post-webinar processes and receive your CEU credits and certificate of completion. Um, I urge all of you to uh, let me know. You can let me know. I'll be here on the chat window for the next 15 minutes or so. So if you are having some troubleshooting questions, um, we can do our best to accommodate those. Um, and again, thank you so much, Lori, and thank you all for attending. We really, really appreciate it. And uh, you know, it wouldn't be a successful program if it wasn't for all of you. So thank you. And um, please do stay in touch. Okay.